Hello, everybody. My name is Patrick Butler. I am the Vice President of Content and Community at the International Center for Journalists in Washington, DC. And we're very thrilled today to be doing a webinar on as part of our continuing series on countries uh, that have been successful in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and really kind of looking at what factors have enabled them to have more success than other countries. We've also looked at Taiwan most recently. Uh, before that, we looked at Sweden, which has had a very different approach and arguable whether it's been a successful one or not. Uh, and we will continue to do this, um, this series and look at some other countries and especially in the Global South that are also showing uh, some success. So I'm thrilled today that we're going to be digging into the uh, question of Germany and how it has had really uh, pretty amazing success. Uh, and with us is Professor Michael Meyer Herman. He is the head of the Department of Systems Immunology at the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research in Braunschweig, Germany. He studied physics, mathematics, and philosophy in Frankfurt, Maine and Paris, and he received his PhD in theoretical elementary particle physics in Frankfurt Mine. So welcome, Professor Meyer Herman. Thank you very much. Hi, Patrick. Great. Well, we're here, as most of you know, as part of the Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum, which now has about 3,500 members across the globe. If you're looking for, if you're not a member of, of the forum, uh, just search on Facebook for ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum and join us on Facebook. I'm pleased that this particular webinar is being co-sponsored by the Arthur F. Burns Fellowships Program, which is an exchange between US and Canadian journalists and German journalists. Uh, this is a program that ICFJ runs uh, with our German counterpart, uh, uh, which is the International Journalist Program in Germany. And a special thanks to Dr. Frank Dieter Freiling, who is the head of international affairs at the ZDF television network in Germany and our primary partner on this program. And he was very instrumental in connecting me to Professor Meyer Herman. So welcome to the Burns Fellows and alumni who are joining us for this webinar. For those who uh, speak other languages as your first language, you should know that we are also running forums in Arabic, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, with about 5,000 members across those four languages, so about 8,500 members in all five languages. If you're not on Facebook, you can visit the COVID-19 resource page on www.icfj.org, where you can sign up for newsletters to get news on upcoming webinars and other events, visit ijnet.org, which is our go-to website for journalists around the world in eight languages. You can sign up there to receive our weekly bulletin with the latest stories on journalism trends, tip sheets, and opportunities. Um, now for the webinar today, please remember that you can type in your questions during the discussion in the Zoom chat on the icon below. We welcome you to submit questions. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can post your questions just below the video post. This is an on, rec on the record discussion and we will post both the video and a written summary of the webinar on icfj.org and ijnet.org. All right, well, that's enough of an introduction. So let's go ahead and get started with Professor Meyer Herman. And I wanna just start with the obvious question, uh, a little bit of background here. According to the Johns Hopkins University's Coronavirus Resource Center, death rates for the United States and four of the largest countries in Western Europe, France, Italy, Spain, and the UK, range from 46 to 64 per 100,000. Germany's rate is 11. That's a huge difference. Um, and I just want to start with the question of how did Germany manage to protect so many of its citizens when its big neighbors could not? So, yeah, starting off with a, um, uh, let's say, complex question, because actually it is very difficult to find the reason for some development in detail. However, there are some things that may be mentioned in that context, and one uh, that is certainly important is um, that we started off uh, by testing and tracing rather early, and so that we managed to keep the total case numbers rather low and didn't have a huge wave. We had had a first wave, but it was already quite contained um, because of the early starting. So the time point of really starting with the measures is a critical thing. 
and uh, you can so we do simulations of these kind of things right and um so you can see that um if you start off a week later with the measures you are getting a much higher peak than if you start a week earlier and so the timing of of the measures is something very critical and um so if you if you think further um, the other thing that went probably well in Germany is the information flow from science to politics and back to the population. Um, so that's something that um, is maybe special to Germany. I don't know why it happened like that. So, but in, in, as a matter of fact, the people were starting to already fulfill the measures before the measures were actually decided upon, about. So, so the for example, the, the wearing of the masks was done before actually it was decided. So we had this opening in, in, in April in Germany. And um, so after the stronger lockdown, we had this opening. And um, so in the beginning, it was a week um, of open shops, but without duty of wearing masks. But the people were starting to wear the masks anyway. And, and so there, they were somehow ahead of the measures, kind of, right? And, and this is something that was probably because people understood that it's a serious situation and they have to act. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is a major point. That was yeah, there. and, and um, you know, your, your chancellor, of course, is, is a scientist herself. And, and at, would you say that, that Germany took perhaps a more science-based approach to the pandemic than some other countries did that were maybe more focused on political questions? I, I strongly believe so. And actually, um, she, she was asking me for, for support. And uh, so, and, and she's speaking the same, we're both physicists, right? So, so <laughs> she's speaking the same language. And even if I say something that is maybe not meant for the general public, she will understand that. And she understands the spirit of what I'm saying. So that um, actually the interaction was a very positive one. And um, I, I think it was influencing the, the decisions that she was taking. And even she had difficulty. I don't know if you, so I have probably to explain this federal system in, in Germany, yeah, because you have the chancellor who is somehow supervising the whole thing. But on the other hand, we have uh, prime ministers in all of the different parts of Germany. And each prime minister can take decisions on his own her own. And uh, so, so that's uh, something that was bringing up some tension between the chancellor and the prime ministers, because the chancellor was following a very strict path and a clear philosophy, but not all of the prime ministers were following that, so that then different German parts had different rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was kind of a, a bit uh, struggling. And in that time, also the, the cases were somehow not so stable. Yeah, but uh, we are back on track now. So Yeah. Of course, we have a similar situation in the United States where governors yeah. of different states can, can pretty much set their own policies. How did that uh, affect Germany in the sense of uh, if one uh, region of Germany had one policy and a, another region had perhaps a less restrictive one, with people moving back and forth in the country, um, Italy and, and Spain and some other uh, countries really tried to prevent people from even moving within the country, but Germany didn't really take that strong of a, a stand. So how did that impact things when people went, went from one area that had less restrictive policies to an area that was more restrictive or vice versa? It's, it was actually, so the, the first thing I said why there was a success is that people followed the rules even before they were installed. And um, so it was the general acceptance of the public that was a m major point in that context. Now, if you have different rules in different parts of Germany, everybody says, well, but they do it this way, so why should I do it? Yeah, so, and so, so it is somehow undermining um, the general belief that it's right to do this and that measure. And, um, and this is, overall changing and, and increasing the in infection dynamics. And so, so that was somehow the major effect, yeah, because people were just saying, okay, now I do my party. I wanted to, to do my party anyway, so, but it's now allowed with 50 people in the neighbor city, so why shouldn't I do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is no reason, yeah. So obviously the measures here are stupid, yeah. So let's just do whatever I want. And so this is kind of um, not, not a good strategy. This is why I was strongly 
um, pushing that actually we have a more homogeneous mm -hmm. set of rules. Yeah. Um, so, so you can do it still differentially in the different parts, but um, it is important that the rules are the same, mm -hmm. right? So, but if you have no cases in a certain region of Germany, why would you then have major restrictions there? No point of doing that, right? So you can, but the, the, this, the criteria according to which you decide about the, uh, the, the measures, they should be the same everywhere. And so that's somehow the, um, the way, and actually I would say it's even in Europe, right? Yeah. So I would go a step further from there. So, and so, so what we didn't really manage to do in, in, in Germany and the different federal states, I think we should have done it in whole Europe and have a common philosophy of how to set up the measures in whole Europe. We didn't manage to do that. For me, it was a mischance of, of um, European politics. Do you think it w it's even possible given, given countries' autonomy within the European Union or uh, could it have been achieved and, and just lacked leadership or, or do you think it's just impossible? No, I don't think it's impossible. So it may be okay. I'm idealistic. I think it, it would require that um, uh, people accept a panel who is making recommendations and um, then it could work out. But I agree that it's difficult. So, but people were not so far apart. Actually, the difference between the different countries in Germany, uh, in, in Europe uh, is, is more about um, the dynamics rather than about the general philosophy. So in beginning Sweden was a bit different um, because they uh, talked a lot about herd immunity and now accepted meanwhile that it's not possible. But um, uh, so, but otherwise the general philosophy was not so different. So I think we could have done it in a more unified way. And then also the, the closing of borderlines um, for traveling wouldn't be necessary anymore. The only reason why we close the borders is because the infection dynamics is different on the other side of the border. So um, why would I do that? If we have all the common philosophy of how to deal with the situation, then we can just open all borders again. Were there any areas where you felt that Germany didn't do as well as it should have? Um, well, so, so you know, it's, it's still a pandemic. And uh, so, so there, there was a lot of harm, you know, it's, it's not about, uh, not only about uh, the deaths that we have had, uh, it is also about uh, companies that went bankrupt. And it's, um, if you look in my background, I'm, I'm in a family of artists. And uh, so, so the artists were just not gaining any money anymore. So it was, so if you are a singer or something, so an opera singer or something, you just have zero income, yeah? so nothing. So it's not a, and, and so this is um, uh, something that is very difficult to protect from. And um, so there was still a lot of people suffering from the situation. And um, I don't know if we could have improved it and how. Yeah, and maybe if we would have done the measures even earlier than we did, maybe the wave would have been a little bit more contained and maybe everything could have been kept more open. Also restaurants, I'm not sure that we needed to close the restaurants. Mm. So in the end, so it could be that it was not necessary. But it, this is actually a difficult thing. You know, we, we talk about Bayesian inference. So we try to see all the different cases and then to see which measure was actually necessary. Because we don't know which measure was doing what. Yeah? So it's a mixture of everything. And so, so how to disentangle that, it's really difficult. Right. Um, interesting that, that you bring up that idea of, of the restaurants and, and the closing. Two, two points there. One is, uh, Germany also got a lot of credit for its economic support for businesses uh, mm -hmm. that other countries did not have and for, for people who were not out of work. Um, how do you think that went in Germany? Do you, do you feel like that helped uh, prevent some of the economic misery that, that might have happened otherwise? Definitely. Definitely that helped a lot. And um, so what I think is an important um, understanding of the situation that is also probably not there in US as I see it from outside. I'm a bit careful with that statement. So I was publishing a paper together with the uh, IFO Institute. So it's an institute of um, a survey of economy. And um, so what we came up with a conclusion is um, that actually economy and health have the same interest. So on the short term, it seems like a contradiction. 
right? So because um, you close the restaurant, so the restaurant is in difficulties. Yeah? And, and uh, you do it in order to contain the virus. So you give a priority to the virus, you could argue. Yeah? But if you think on the long term, people will not go to the restaurant if it's open and there is the risk of getting the virus there. And uh, so if you think on the long term, it is just the same interest. We have to contain the virus so that we can have an active economy and a secure health system. So this is the same direction to go and, and to have the right m degree of measures, not too much, but such that you can contain the virus and still open the economy. This is the way to go, right? And, and lo in long term, the costs of having a second lockdown would be amazing. Yeah, so then, yeah. then it's, this kills everything. If you have a second lockdown, this is not possible to, to go over. Yeah, so. Well, that brings up another question. Do you think that, that we may face a, a resurgence that might require a second lockdown, both in Germany and, and other places, especially as cooler weather comes in the Northern Hemisphere, people spend more time inside. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate that happening? And if so, could that require a second uh, lockdown or at least more restrictions in place? So. I'm, I'm, you know, even modeling, uh, you can do predictions, but this is just predictions that you can do for the next three weeks. And um, so the long term thing is much more difficult and depends on many factors. And so I cannot make, give a very clear statement on, on, on that. But uh, what you can see is uh, during the summertime now in Germany, now talking about Germany, so people were traveling, vacation. Right, mm -hmm. and and so they were bringing back the virus to Germany, and we were going back from 200 cases per day to 2,000 cases per day, mm -hmm. so factor of 10. And so the interesting thing about that is that, according to a colleague of mine who did the simulation, um, Anita Schöbel, uh, she was saying that um, uh, uh, this increase in cases was mostly just because of people coming back from holiday and not because of a changed behavior in Germany. So the dynamics within Germany were the same as before, or m maybe a little bit different, but not too much, so that after the wave of people coming back is over, things are relaxing again. Yeah, so and going, so asymptotically going into the same state as, as it was before the vacation time. And, okay. and so, so this is one thing that uh, we have to be aware that we can learn two things from that. One is the virus is there. So if you bring it, it will expand. The other thing is the measures we have are able to contain it. But as you say, if we are now staying inside and being in closed rooms and most of the infections happen in closed rooms, um, then it will have an, an intensified uh, dynamics of, of viral infections so that the whole thing will start again. And the question is whether we are able to contain it without another lockdown. And this is really hard to foresee. But we have to be aware that it will come and we have to be prepared. So the whole tracing and, uh, and testing is a major thing. And um, but we have also to be aware that it's not sufficient, right? So tracing and testing and isolation, these three things work perfectly in Japan, for example. Uh, so even without testing, so just tracing and then isolating everybody who had contact. Um, so so that's, that's a thing that worked perfectly, but it brings down the re reproduction number by a factor of two. So if we start by three, at three, so we end up in 1.5. So we are still above one, which means we have still an exponential growth. So we need more than that in order to really contain the virus in that situation. So we will need to combine the tracing um, and uh, isolation strategy together with continuation of mask wearing, in particular in closed rooms and having a little bit um, of fresh air from time to time. Yeah. So let's let's go back to that the testing and tracing uh, that you talked about as one of the strategies that was so successful for Germany. Um, tell us a little bit more about how Germany did it. Um, I know there were some apps that were were people were using to or the or I guess the officials were using to to uh, you know track people's contacts with other people. How did yeah. that work? How did that work with privacy concerns? 
that sort of oh. thing. So um, if you're talking about the app, actually that is not the part I would consider to be a success story in Germany. Um, so it, it took so long that actually the first wave was over when uh, the app was finally released. And this was because of a very strong pressure from the side of um, the protection of human rights and individual rights. Uh, so there was lots of discussions and actually the strategy was changed at least two or three times on halfway so that people start developing and then stopped again new strategy. And so it took ages. Uh, and it was finally released, I think, in May. So everything was already contained there. So, so having so that was not a really brilliant story, I would say. Okay. And, uh, and and but but having said that, now that it's there, so I have it. I have it on my mobile here. Mm -hmm. So it's it's there. And um, now that it's there, even though there is only a small fraction of people really using it. Small. I, I don't know the last number actually, but it's still growing. Um, so every so it helps if the people were there. It is picking some people who are getting into isolation earlier, a few days earlier than if you would just do it by talking stories uh, about whom you met, and so it's also very uncertain. So that helps, and every contribution. So this is a way of thinking. You have to actually think um, that. It's not you have to have a perfect system, right? So that's not the, the goal. The goal is not a perfect system that is catching everybody. The goal is to reduce. And you reduce, you reduce, and if you have sufficient little measures and everybody's contributing to reduce a bit, you're ending up with a reproduction number below one. That's sufficient, right? So the, the app is having a contribution to that. And in that sense, it's useful now in order to go for the next round and to see what happens if we are in the closed rooms. Uh, testing, uh, another big problem that we're having here in the United States is the length of time it takes to get test results, which makes yes. tracing very difficult because by the time you find out that you are positive, you know, it, you've infected many other people and, and, it, and tracing comes a little late. Germany, how, how long did it take you to get your results and, and how were you able to achieve a, a quicker Test it, it, it was faster with time because the whole process was somehow getting fluent. Um, uh, but in the beginning, it was 48 hours. Now it's more 24. Mm -hmm. um, so, but even that, so I, again, I can cite my simulations. If you look at the simulations um, with the knowledge about incubation period and when the virus starts replicating in the patient, the effect of testing is really not big. So that's not a way to go as long as it takes one or two days to get the results. So exactly what you say is true. So either we go for fast tests, right? So that's, um, there is fast um, uh, PCR tests and also mm -hmm. antigen-based tests. They are less sensitive. The antigen-based tests are less sensitive but it's still better because you get the result in 20 minutes. Right. And so with that, you can actually um, think, think of um, a residence home, right? So the people working there can do the test right before they go through the door. And by that prevent bringing the virus into the right. resident home, mm -hmm. which is then a disaster if it's there, right? So because right. you don't, uh, cannot control it. And, and so this kind of things, even if there is a risk that remains, it's still better to have it like that uh, or better than to have the test after two days. Yeah? So that mm -hmm. doesn't help at all in this. I don't, I don't care if I had, uh, yeah, so, so if I'm, I had the test two days ago, the, I can be sick now, right? So this yeah. is, so that is not helping in that instance. Yeah, so, so that's, this is, the testing is a difficult topic and also the capacity of testing is a limitation also in Germany. And so, so my philosophy in that is um, more the Japanese way of doing, just trace, isolate, and if you want to get out of the quarantine after five or seven days, you can do a test, and if it's negative, you stop the quarantine. Yeah. That's it's a way. So the the testing would be somehow in order to deliberate from isolation, but not in order to decide whether to go to isolation. So you go to isolation by default, and then 
you can go out if you have a test that is negative. Yeah, so this is the way to go. And that would actually be an effective measure. And, and um, that requires compliance, uh, both tracing and uh, isolation require compliance. People have to be willing to tell you who they've had contact with and they have to be willing to isolate. Yeah. And as you said earlier, Germany did very well on the compliance question initially. We have started to see some protests in Germany, including uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, right-wing group set the Reichstag. Um, do you see that as, as a, is that just a small group and not really important or is this a growing movement to protest against wearing masks and, and giving up my contacts and tracing and things like that? Uh, it, well, it's not really surprising that it happens, right? So th this, um, the right wing is actually taking every occasion to sit on something and uh, to take advantage in order to do some more propaganda. So that's not a new thing in neither in Germany nor in other countries. I Meanwhile, uh, luckily, and um, it's not, not a German special thing anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so this is um, something that uh, uh, I, I would have been surprised by that this not happening. And also, if you think of other pandemics, you have also always have these people who deny that the virus is existing and have some conspiracy um, theory um, and how this all him so Bill Gates was inventing it right so so this kind of thing so you have these movements all the time so th this is actually harming a bit the infection dynamics because those movements they don't wear masks so they they go on the street and are narrowly together and then they don't wear masks so there will be infection dynamics induced by this movement but the containment that we have over all the country should be enough just to tolerate that. And um, so this is why I'm not so much stressed about that. Okay. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, what about uh, schools? Obviously, we're, we're at a point now, in, again, in, in our countries in the north where, where students are returning to schools. Mm -hmm. Germany has, again, had some su pretty, pretty successful return to school with some outbreaks, but action taken pretty quickly when there are outbreaks. Do you feel like it's, it's going well, uh, the return to school? And do you think that um, it's something that, that is necessary given uh, the advantages of being there in person over having to do it online, which of course has many disparities in terms of who has access and things like that? So school is a very difficult topic for me because I was very nervous about it. And, um, the point here is that we actually don't know exactly about uh, the transmission dynamics in the Yau. And um, this, um, so we don't have enough information to really say. So we know if they get sick, they don't get less, they get less symptoms. So this is what we know uh, overall. There might still be long-term effects that we shouldn't neglect. Yeah, so it's not that uh, every else should become sick because we, we are not sure about long-term effects now. Um, and there is some hints that uh, we don't want to have. And um, in that sense, um, yes. So, but, so what is about the transmission? So if they are getting less symptoms, are they less transmissible? transmissible? So are they less infectious to others, right? So is that the case? So if that was the case, we could actually be a little more relaxed about bringing them to school because transmission dynamics in the school wouldn't be the same as, for example, in a, a meat facility, yeah? and uh, as we have seen. And, um, and so, so it's a difficult thing there. And on the other hand, you have to look at the contact matrices. So there is, a, you can go in every country for that. So it's just a peak in the school. Right, so they, they have just many, many more contacts and real contacts. They are just hugging all the time and do whatever they, right? And so, so many more contacts than in any other part of, of the society. So even if they are less infectious, there is still a big danger because of the number of contacts. And so for some reason, I don't know, and it's interesting that it happens like that. So far, the cases that have been identified in school didn't develop into a kind of little pandemic, little super spreading event in the school. So and it's, it was sufficient to either um, remove one school class 
and isolate one school class or even just the neighbors uh, sitting together uh, in the school. So it seems to work. And, and so if, it work, if it's working like that in Germany, I think other countries can do the same. On the other hand, if you think of China, they didn't reopen the schools so early, right? So this is, uh, they were very careful about it. And um, so there is plus and, and minus here, and it's really difficult to get the right balance to make a definite decision of whether this works or not. Okay. Uh, there was a South Korean study recently that showed that uh, I think it was a, around age 10, there tends to be a difference in transmissibility. Younger children don't transmit as much as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, preteens and teenagers. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing any evidence of that in Germany in terms of the return to schools that, that uh, it, when, it, when there is transmission, it tends to happen with older students? So I don't see any statistics that would support that. Okay. But uh, it's plausible. Yeah? yeah. So I think it's plausible that it's like that. And uh, okay. yeah. That needs more study then. Yeah, yeah. So we cannot say it. So, so it's one case. And so, you know, the statistics are not so huge. So if I count the cases that have been here in Germany, it's still just a few. So if you put a standard deviation, it's just whatever you right. want. Yeah, right. so. um, I want to remind everyone that we welcome your questions for Professor Meyer Herman. Uh, if you're on uh, Zoom, just uh, type your questions into the chat. I'll be taking a look at those shortly and, and we'll uh, pass some of those on. If you're on Facebook, you can also type your questions in the chat there and my colleagues will add them to, to the chat here on Zoom. So please do send your questions. Um, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, other parts of the world. Of course, much of our audience comes from the Global South, Africa, Latin America, South Asia. Um, and, and Germany has had a great deal of success, but of course it's a country with a lot of resources. Do you feel like any of the things that Germany did well are adaptable to countries with uh, fewer resources than Germany has? Well, um, so if I think back to my first um, answer that um, a big part of the success and the containment in Germany is about information um, that is going from science to politics to the population, this is not very expensive. That's nothing that you couldn't install somewhere else, even though uh, it might be difficult in some parts of Africa, for example, to reach every citizen. Um, and uh, to really inform the person um, about the situation and about the correct behavior. So I see that that might be a difficulty that is bigger than uh, in, in, in Western Europe and, and, and US where you can just reach everybody by social media. And so, so there is a difficulty there, but I think this is not expensive and you can install it everywhere. And so that's um, something that I don't see a problem. However, if you think of India, um, and so that's a really disaster, a real disaster there. So in my working group, I have uh, three Indian people and they are just trying to um, support. Um, uh, but it's impossible because people are so dense and all generations sit together in, in, in a very narrow thing, uh, narrow manner. So that, so it's, um, it's very difficult to protect the elderly. Right, so because they are just living in the same region and on a very close room, and so that, um, yeah. And Have you an seen any examples growth. of? I'm sorry, it's an unlimited growth yeah. in India right now. So it's just. Yeah. Have you seen any examples of countries uh, in the global south that you think have have been real success stories? I don't know about those in in Africa, but I know that in Africa in general, the the. Um, um, viral spreading is not so dramatic as in other countries like India. Yeah, so it's, yeah. All right. I'm um, going to uh, take a look and see if we have any questions yet. Um, but while I do that, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about vaccines. Um, I know you're not a vaccine developer, but um, do you, uh, Germany is, is a leader in the search for vaccines. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how soon you expect to see that in Germany and what the impact is? A lot of people are looking at vaccines as sort of a miracle. It's going, then it's all going to go away as soon as we have them, which may be a little bit uh, Pollyannish, as we say. What yeah. And um, so the, the, the story of vaccine is a very difficult one. So I don't think it is 
a limitation to develop a vaccine right now. And uh, so you see already many vaccines that are there and um, that are being tested. However, uh, the, the question, so if you normally bring a vaccine onto the market, it is not something that you do within a few weeks. Yeah, so this is not time scale. You have to test, mm -hmm. you have to see whether there is any side effects. You have to see whether actually protection is effective. And now if you go to that part, um, there is some peculiarities of that virus that are, um, uh, let's say, inserting some doubts um, about that part. Because, um, for example, um, people who um, have had a serious, a severe um, infection and have died afterwards, uh, if you look into the lymph nodes of those people, you don't find so-called germinal centers. These are um, specialized parts of the lymph nodes uh, where you develop new antibodies that are then being of high affinity for the virus. So typically, uh, if you have a viral infection um, and you should be full of those germinal centers and they are just not there for some reason, which means that the antibodies that are being eventually generated in those patients are just short-lived, likely. Yeah, so I'm speculating a bit here. And, and, and if they are short-lived, it means that the antibodies will not protect for a long time. And so now in vaccination, you might induce maybe more because the, maybe the B cell part, so the antibody part is not working well. So you can go for another line and try to make more T lymphocyte based response. So people are testing all these kind of things. But we don't know exactly about this immune response and we don't have sufficient information to really be sure that the vaccine will be a long-term protection at least for a year or so. So mm -hmm. like in influenza that you can vaccinate every year and hope, but even in influenza, protection is sometimes just 15% or something. Yeah, so. And of course, the, the flu vaccine changes every year based on what strain uh, scientists expect yeah. to be dominant. So, the mutation and, and this, is not yet known, right? So there is right. some mutations that are there and that seem to become dominant. But um, yeah, so this is, uh, we don't have sufficient experience to see where this goes. Okay. Um, we have um, we have a lot, lot of questions from the audience, so that's great to see. So uh, staying on the topic of vaccines, uh, from uh, our uh, audience member, Annalisa Quinn asks, Germany has a stronger anti-vaxxer movement than the U.S. and many other countries. Is that a concern as the vaccine gets closer to reality? And how much of, I'll add my own follow-up to that, how much of that is, is sort of the anti-vaxxer, anti-science uh, conspiracy, and how much of that is, is perhaps legitimate concern that we're rushing on the vaccine and it may not be safe? So, um, I, I don't feel that it's uh, so. Let's start the other way. Um, uh, in a few months ago, we had 50% of people who were willing to um, be vaccinated if, an, if a vaccine is there. This went down to something like 20% or so now. Um, so, so, yes, there is a kind of skepticism, but maybe this is also related to the fact that we are now containing the virus and the necessity to become vaccinated with all the question marks that are associated and the unknown side effects. So you would go for a vaccine and really want it only if you feel a real danger. Mm -hmm. And this is not the feeling that we are, have right now here. Uh, so that um, this might be a big part that um, is influencing uh, the opinion of, of skepticism, um, yeah, in, in Germany you, at least. Are, are you, a lot of people feel we have to get to a certain level of vaccinated population to achieve herd immunity, uh, and if we have a lot of people hesitant to take it, that, that we won't get to that level. Mm -hmm. Is that concern or is that um, not really? So, you, so I'm... I'm very skeptical that we will have a vaccine that will induce herd immunity. So not only because um, people will not all become vaccinated. So the problem already is if you have a vaccine that is considered to be secure and efficient. So that's two things we have to know. So if we have that, 
we have to produce it and who is getting it in first place. So already there, there is a decision to take. And um, so we will not have this wave of vaccinating the whole population uh, and, and uh, then having herd immunity. And then the question is, how long is the immunity lasting as I was describing before? So even that is not known. And um, in view of that, uh, maybe this is not a way to build on. So maybe we are having a good situation. We get a secure and really efficient vaccine that is inducing immunity for a year. And this will be there in January or March. So possible, yeah, but we cannot build on that because we don't have it now. And we have no clear path to know that we will have it. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's sobering, uh, but, but important to hear that. We, we, I think a lot of people are counting on that to, uh, to change everything. Um, all right, let, more questions here. Um, this one is from Eric Herbst. Uh, what is your assessment of the Trump administration's response to COVID-19? Okay. Um, a broad question there, but <laughs> if you're willing to take it on. So if I compare, so I, I will try to, to be um, uh, kind of friendly. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, so if I compare the um, relationship of Trump and uh, Dr. Fauci uh, to, for example, um, uh, Angela Merkel and myself, uh, I would say there is a big difference because um, the one relationship is obviously a constructive one um, and the other one is kind of uh, not being a scientific exchange. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I, I would think that it would have been possible to make things better if the communication between the two would have been a bit more intense. Um, how often are you in communication with the chancellor? Uh, it sounds like you're, you're a pretty close advisor on, on this question. Um, we have a meeting every two weeks. Two weeks, okay, great. Um, another question from the forum comes from Jim Berklin, uh, and this is uh, about uh, nursing home, or, or, or as you called them, residential facilities, I think. In many countries, uh, including the US and, and others, COVID deaths related to nursing home personnel hover around 40%. What is the experience in Germany and what are any specific policies followed with regard to keeping nursing home residents safe and or locked down? I'm not sure about that statistic. Deaths at 40% seems a little high to me, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know that either. Um, but uh, in general, I can say that it's a major concern because we know about those, I would call it a hub, Namely, that the nurses are in contact to people who are particularly vulnerable, either because they are old or because they are sick or have other um, diseases. And um, in that sense, this is a really important issue to take care that um, the people who are um, helping there, so the nurses, are not infected. And this is something that, um, so in Italy, uh, what um, uh, the person, I forgot the name, sorry, um, was describing was a major issue in the beginning. Yeah, so because, um, uh, so someone was getting symptoms and in Germany, you go to the so-called house doctor and the house doctor tells you to stay home. In Italy, uh, the person was going to the hospital. Okay. Yeah, and uh, so was spreading the virus in the hospital. And, and that was uh, part of the disaster that happened in, in Italy. So I think it sh the, uh, it's a very important point that was raised here. Uh, and it is particularly important to take care of that uh, very consciously. Yeah, I remember when we had Dr. Anders Tegnall from Sweden on and, uh, uh, doing a webinar. And he mentioned that as very, he was very much defending Sweden's approach, which is, is much uh, about, as you said earlier, uh, trying to get to herd immunity in a natural way. Uh, but he said where they fell down was, was protecting people in nursing homes that mm -hmm. didn't do enough to, to protect them. And that was one of the reasons Sweden had such a high uh, death rate. Um, Germany, I think, did, did better in that way, would you say? Protecting its most vulnerable? Yeah. Um, so 
for one part of that, but that's not a difference to Sweden, but maybe to Italy, is that um, uh, the generations are not living so much together in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, so it's more on the level of US. Um, and uh, so I think uh, the statistics say something like 6% um, of the people live um, across generations. Um, and um, so that was part of why I think in Germany, the elderly were kind of protected more easily than in other countries like Italy, but it wouldn't explain Sweden. Um, and um, so, but Sweden was kind of letting it go, as you say, for, to some degree. And uh, this is maybe diff dangerous in the view of, of the dark numbers, so-called dark number. Mm -hmm. So I think one part that was making Germany kind of controllable is that the dark number is comparably low to other countries. All right, let's go. We have many more questions are coming in. Um, and this is a one that takes a little bit of an optimistic take, perhaps, from Sarah Fawkes. Do you think the pandemic has or can have a long-term positive impact on the relationship between science and politics and public understanding of science in Germany and elsewhere? So a shift that might support activity on other issues like climate change. Yeah, I, would, I was just going to mention the climate change. That is a positive effect indeed. Um, uh, so um, I think it already did. Um, so that's uh, that was already, so the, uh, you can have to imagine that uh, in talk shows in Germany for the last four months, there was hardly a talk show without a scientist. Mm -hmm. And you can ask a year ago whether there was any scientist at all. So I think there was none. Maybe someone who was wow. uh, discovering life on Venus would have been invited to a talk show, but um, nobody else, right? So this is nothing that happened. And so the science and the scientists were already carried into the public communication. And yes, this was actually also an, um, an assessment of one of the talk show masters was already saying uh, that she hopes that this will persist uh, beyond the pandemic that the interest of, of, of the public into scientific thinking and scientific knowledge uh, is kept on the level as it is now. So yeah, I would share this optimism. Another potentially optimistic point that I, I also wanted to bring up is uh, this will not be the last pandemic that we face in the world. Um, and uh, this one perhaps has, has uh, awoken us uh, to the potential danger uh, and do you feel that in the future we might be better prepared when another pandemic hits or are, does our tendency to just kind of okay that's over we can go back to normal no um so it will have an impact because um so for i can now speak for germany again so in germany there is um a lot of money that is spent now for projects that are helping in keeping this pandemic controlled and, and now the important part, and establishing methods that are transferable to other pandemics. So this is directly preparing for the next virus. Yeah. And so we have to learn what we have to do in this situation and we have to be prepared for the next, identify the next pandemic and contain it before it is a pandemic. This is the two things we have to do and to install the measures to really react quickly. And this is certainly only possible if the whole world is doing the same thing, right? So because as we have seen, the virus is everywhere, right? So right. within a few weeks. Um, another question from Ryan Delaney, who has a follow-up on the schools question. Uh, do you recommend more health measures for schools and students going into the fall in our northern hemisphere, such as attending on alternating days or uh, requiring masks in class? So this is, I would go the other way. Okay. Um, namely, um, so as, as it looks like now, school opening was not a major problem, which is surprising to me. So I was not predicting that. And um, so if, but if it works, 
And if it's fine to some degree and we can react to single cases that happen to be there, um, then I think this is sufficient. It's not changing. I don't see any need to adapt uh, the strategy. So I would keep it as open as possible. And this is a kind of learning process that we have and which may also depend on the season. We have to see that as, as the claim could be that we have to change our philosophy in, in fall when it's getting colder. So it is a, for me, it's a big problem that um, uh, children will come up with a normal flu, a normal cold. So they have symptoms. So what are you doing with this person? Yeah, so what are you doing with, with his pupil? Do you send him to school? Mm, difficult, might be COVID. And right. yeah, and uh, so, so you need to test first and have a negative test and then you can send back to school. So then half of the school will be empty. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is, this is the problem we have to solve to probably, uh, so the, the, the need is to identify which virus do we have here and do we have to react or not. Uh, so I see the problems there. So it's back to the testing thing. Right. Yeah? So, I, what I, so the vision I have, which I, I don't know if it will be there at some point, is you, you clean your teeth in the morning and you do a test. Mm -hmm. And then you go out. Daily. Yeah? So mm -hmm. that's, that would be a nice thing that um, yeah. people are working on that kind of thing. Right. Yeah? So I don't know when it will be there, but so this is something that we can maybe install in, on the long term at least. Great. Another question from Annalisa Quinn, which was uh, also on my list, um, to talk a little bit about the role of the news media, since we are a group of journalists here uh, in Germany. How do you assess how, how the media did there in terms of uh, helping to communicate to the public? Uh, and if you have any sense of it, uh, other countries such as the U.S.? I, I cannot tell about the U.S. I'm, okay. I'm watching CNN from time to time. Okay. And um, so... Uh, this is not sufficient in order to make a major statement on that. Um, but yes, the, the media were helping a lot in communicating. Um, and um, so in the phase where we had um, a stronger lockdown and the discussion of whether we open or not and whether um, we should open the shops or maybe not and open it with some constraints or maybe not and uh, limit the number of people. So in that phase, it was uh, quite a strong communication via the media uh, and they were approaching many scientists and many politics, including me. Um, so no, I'm not belonging to the politics, but the scientists. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, as, and, and asking for the opinion. And so the positive experience I had is that all the journalists I was talking to were constructive. They were not trying to cheat me in a way and getting some statement out of me that is then turned around in my mouth or something. That's so the reputation of journalists, right? right. Um, so uh, this was not happening at all. So everybody was trying to judge the situation and to help. Mm -hmm. And this was an amazingly positive um, experience for me. Great. So yes, I I'm... think media were playing a big role and a positive one. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, all right. Well, uh, we also had a question uh, on um, people who are asymptomatic, uh, and and the the sort of uh, this was from Disha Shetty. Asymptomatic patients continue to be a huge concern. How did Germany test these patients, and was there any community spread through asymptomatic people? Yeah. So th actually, the whole problem is about asymptomatic asymptomatic pro uh, people. So, so yes, this is well on the point. Um, we wouldn't have this pandemic if asymptomatic people were not there. And maybe we have to also define what asymptomatic means okay. because most people have some symptoms, but they are just negligible. And um, so they are never asymptomatic. So to, I don't know even that, but it's for sure. But what people think is that asymptomatic people are still um, having viral growth so that um, experience in viral growth so that they are actually infectious and this is the problem that they will pass the virus without knowing that they were sick in first place and yes so this is why we have asymptomatic people in our simulations and this is why we have so much difficulties to bring down the pandemic 
because there is too many people who we don't recognize and where we cannot do any isolation. And that's the only solution I have to that. There is no possibility. You cannot test everybody. Yeah, so it would be the only, so one way would be testing everybody, but forget it. We don't have enough tests to do that. So no way of doing this. So the only way is to do the tracing and define clusters of people if you have identified a sick person so that every potential person who can be sick is isolated for a certain period. So define the cluster larger so you will catch the asymptomatic in this cluster. And this is the only way of getting uh, so and this is why the dark number is such a critical point yeah so because the dark number if it's getting too big you're losing control either yeah so the tracing and and isolation strategy only works if you have not such a big dark number another question about um one of the things that we seem to be discovering as uh as this uh, epidemic wears on or pandemic wears on is that people who even people who had mild symptoms can have long lasting effects um in yes. terms of you know their lung capacity and things like that have you looked at, at that at all and and what are you, what are you seeing there yeah, so I have looked at that. And um, so what the definite statement is that I can make is that we don't know enough about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the number of reports in this direction is increasing. And um, but it's actually maybe not so special. So you can find the virus in the brain. And um, but you can also um, look at influenza and you will find concentration problems three months after mm -hmm. influenza is gone. So it's, it's, uh, there, there is a common thing there. Um, but maybe the point is that uh, the, the point of entry for this virus is the ACE2 receptor and you find it in different organs of um, our organism. And in that sense, um, it is affecting different organs uh, and infecting different organs and can have detrimental effects there. Yeah. So that's why it is not a pure lung disease um that um or respiratory tract disease so but it is going beyond that because this receptor is expressed in other parts of the body right okay um well that's uh i think we're about at the end um and so i want to first of all ask you if there's anything we didn't talk about that you think is important uh, anything you you'd like to add before we wrap up that's an interesting question i th i think <laughs> that um we did a good tour so far. Um, so my major concern, that's actually not a, a topic to discuss, but maybe Amy was a statement, my major concern is that we um, kind of find a unified way to deal with this pandemic, not only in Germany, not only in Europe, but all over the world. And uh, we have to find a solidarity that we all try to get this controlled in a way that we can continue our lives. Um, and um, in a way that, not necessarily in the way we did before, maybe we can get some positive effects out of that, as some optimists here in the audience were already saying. Right. Um, uh, so maybe we can take that with us, but um, otherwise we have to have a big solidarity all over the world, and we have to take that as a chance right. to help each other. Which, which brings up one last question, which is the World Health Organization. Um, how do you assess the role it's played? And of course, the US uh, not cooperating with the WHO anymore. Is that uh, a serious problem? Uh, it's, I was a bit shocked when I, I was reading that news. So it's already a while ago. And, yes. um, and uh, so I, I don't understand that philosophy in a way, because um, what is the, what can we do? So we can just close up our country and then think that we can solve our problems in the country. But this is not a problem of a country. It's a problem of humanity. So the only chance to, to solve that is we, if we all stand together and, and help. Yeah? And uh, so to somehow exclude yourself and do your own thing just because you think the World Health Organization is not doing a good job or whatever the reason was, I, I don't understand that. So it's a contrary of what we should do. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I want to thank you very much, Professor Meyer Herman, for being with us today. This was incredibly educational for, for me and for our audience, I know. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to do this. I know you've done this uh, many, many times and, and uh, really appreciate you speaking now to, to our global audience. I also want to thank uh, Frank Dieter Freiling, uh, our partner in Germany, for his help in setting this up and the Arthur F. Burns Fellowship Program, which is co-sponsoring this webinar. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to watch the ICFJ and IJNet websites for a write-up and video of this webinar, which we will also be posting on our YouTube page. Um, that's icfj.org and ijnet.org. Please invite your colleagues to join our forum. Uh, we also remind you that uh, we will be sending you a survey about this webinar, all of you who participated. Uh, and we ask you to fill that out because your feedback is very, very helpful to us as we uh, plan additional webinars in the future. Um, and remember to look for us on Facebook, the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. Uh, and finally, I want to invite everyone to attend ICFJ's online tribute to journalists 2020 awards event. We'll be holding that October 5th, beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern time with a pre-show. Uh, if you can't attend the live event, because obviously for many of you, time zones are not going to be very friendly for that, we invite you to check out our website the following day to watch the tape. This is uh, our annual event where we give out awards to really amazing and inspiring international journalists. Uh, this year from Egypt and Russia, as well as Fareed Zakaria from CNN and the Washington Post. It's a really inspiring event and for the first time it's free and open for anyone to attend because we're doing it online. So we do encourage you to check that out. You can get details of that again on our website icfj.org. So thank you again Dr. Meyer Herman and thank, thank you. It was a pleasure. Joining us. Yeah, it was a pleasure. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And stay healthy. Thank you. You too.